Please welcome Failure is Not an Option by Carl Scotland. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I expect most people are familiar with the story of Apollo 13. Um, kind of famously, the Apollo mission in 1970 uh, to the moon that never made it to the moon uh, because an oxygen tank exploded on the service module. Um, the quote, failure is not an option, is generally associated with that mission. Um, so let's explore that. It's also, also known as NASA's most successful failure, which is a little bit of an oxymoron, because they failed to get to the moon, but they did successfully get everybody back alive. So let's, let's explore failure a little bit. For example, will the clicker fail? There we go. So I'm going to give you a little test to start off with. Um, I have a sequence of uh, numbers, or I have a rule that some sequence of three numbers obey. Um, and I'm going to give you the challenge of trying to discover what that rule is. So I'm going to give you a clue, which is that the sequence 248 conforms to the rule. So have a think. What do you think the rule is? What's your hypothesis about what the rule is? And then how would you go about testing that hypothesis? So what three numbers, what different sequence of three numbers would you give me to test your hypothesis. So, somebody near the front that I can hear. What was there was a sequence of three numbers from over here. 3927 three, does conform to the rule. Any other suggestions? Sorry? 3612 three, does conform to the rule. One more, one more suggestion, maybe on this side. One, two, four does conform to the rule. One, two, seven does conform to the rule. Okay, does anybody want to suggest what they think the hypothesis, what, the, what they think the rule is? Three numbers. <laughs> Any three numbers. It's not quite that simple. It is a trick, but it's not that tricky. There's, there's a hand of here. Number times two. So two times two is four, four times two is eight. So, so I'll, I'll give you the answer here, otherwise we could be here all day, although we were very close down here. The actual rule is that the numbers just increase in magnitude. Okay, very simple. But what our natural inclination and what I think a lot of what I think was going on, you come up with a hypothesis, such as the numbers double in magnitude. So we times the previous number by two. So we test that by kind of going, OK, what's another sequence that conforms to that rule? Uh, 3, 6, 12. Well, that does conform to the rule of increasing numbers, but it's not really giving us much information. Now, if somebody had given me the sequence 3, 2, 1, I would have then said that doesn't conform to the rule. But that's not a natural thing to do, to, to try and disprove our hypothesis. So the way to, to solve this problem is not to come up with a hypothesis and then try and prove your hypothesis. It's to come up with a hypothesis and then can try and disprove it. So I f if I think the hypothesis is the doubling in magnitude, I want to give a sequence of numbers that doesn't do that, which would say be 1, 2, 3. Now, that's now generating information. We get more information when what we expect to happen doesn't happen. Effectively, we get more information and we get more learning when we fail. So I talk about failure not being an option. Um, I'll come back to actually failure is very, very important because it's through failure that we generate learning and generate information from which we get better and from which we improve. So we need to get good at failing. Um, this is the maths behind it. Um, on this side, if your probability of failure is zero, so that means if you're always succeeding, you're not generating any new information because you know everything already. Equally, on this side of the scale, if your probability of failure is 100%, that means you're failing all the time, which probably means you're not using anything using that information to, to do anything. So you're, you're not really getting any new information equally. So the middle ground here is 50%. If we fail 50% of the time, 
we generate maximum information, which means we've got maximum chance of learning. That's very counterintuitive, particularly in organizations. So I want to talk through some of some ideas and some thoughts around how can we increase our ability to fail and fail well so that we can learn better. Because we don't just want to go around copying other things. If we go around copying other, other people, again, we're not generating new information and not learning. I wonder if the clicker only works when I'm further back. There we go. So uh, can we play the first video? So this is a little video about copying Spotify. So when we're, when we're going through Agile transformations, <laughs> this, this, is, this is on YouTube. This, I, I didn't create this video. This is a guy called Jason Little um, who, who gave me permission to use it. Um, and it's that message that when we're, when we're going through Agile transformations, we don't want to just copy what other organizations have done and impose them on our people and our organizations. We need to learn for ourselves what's going to work for us in our context, which means we need to get good at learning through failure. Um, so, so the first point with learning from failure then is expecting the unexpected. Has, has anybody here heard of Terrorhawks? I'm not expecting anybody to. So this is a, a fairly obscure British um, TV show from the 1980s by Gerry Anderson. So you've probably heard of Gerry Anderson. Um, famously did a lot of puppet shows, Thunderbirds, um, those sorts of things. So this was his last kind of TV show, puppet show, which I think only ever got shown in the Britain. Um, but it had the catchphrase, expect the unexpected. Um, you know, something, some, there would be some twist in every episode um, which wasn't expected, so they always had to expect the unexpected. And I like that phrase um, for when we're thinking about imposing, yeah, sorry, imposing, introducing new practices and figuring out what practices work and which ones don't. I think I'm going to hand stand further back. Um, so we're just going to go through every one of these now. Is that OK? Um, there's cognitive biases. So the, the main reason, the first reason we want to expect the unexpected is because we're biased not to. So our brain is, is set up in ways that we just, we just only ever pick out certain bits of information. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a cognitive bias codex which goes through, there's, there's about 100 in there. Um, I'm just going to talk through some of my favorite ones in detail to kind of get across this idea of we really need to pay attention to the way we're thinking. So the first one is cognitive dissonance. Um, this is defined as the inattention we feel when our beliefs are challenged by the evidence. Uh, my favorite example of this is when I come to a, an escalator, so these kind of moving stairs and the escalator is not working, and you have to walk down the escalator. And it does my head in, because my body believes that the escalator should be moving. And there's a certain different kind of dynamic to walking down a moving escalator. But because it's not moving, it, in theory, it should be just like walking down stairs. But for some reason up here, it's not. So there's this, there's this tension. My body thinks that I should be working in a certain way because the stairs, the escalator should be moving, but the evidence is that the escalator's not moving, and I have to figure that one out. And we see this when we expect a certain, a certain solution to generate certain results, and then it doesn't generate those results, and we get this cognitive dissonance. That's not what we expected. And our natural tendency is to discard the evidence. We say, oh, well, there's, there's some reason, there's some rational explanation for why that didn't work. Our theory is still correct. The solutions did still work. So we need to be aware of when things don't happen that we expect them in the way that we expect them to do and learn from that. 
that's okay, that's interesting, I should pay attention to that, rather than, oh, something else went wrong, my, my pet theory is still correct. So cognitive dissonance is the first one. Um, the next one, the God complex. An unshakable belief characterized by consistently inflated feelings of personability, privilege, or infallibility. This picture here um, is a work by Anthony Gormley. So it's a, there's a hundred of these statues, which are all modeled on, on Anthony Gormley, set out um, on the coast uh, near Liverpool. Um, Liverpool, the kind of home of the best football team in the world. Okay, and I don't mean Everton. Um, but the tide rises and the statues stay there, so at, at high tide, you kind of, the statues are half built. But that's similar, and that reminds me of the story of King Canute. So King Canute the Great, who was in the early 11th century, king of England, uh, Denmark, and Norway. And he famously got his courtiers to carry him down to the beach in his, in his throne. And he sat there on, on his throne, and he commanded the tide to go out. So he said to the sea, go out. And obviously the sea carried on coming in, and, and he got his feet wet. Um, and that's, that's generally interpreted as, as him trying, genuinely trying to control the sea. But actually what he was trying to do was show that he was just human. Even though he was this great king of three lands, he wasn't God. He couldn't control the tide. Um, and that's, that's kind of an example of he, him, him basically trying to demonstrate that he didn't have the God complex. So the God complex is where we think, because we're, we're a senior, experienced um, kind of person in the organization with the leadership role, therefore that means we should have the answers. And therefore that means we can tell people what to do when we can impose solutions. We don't. None of us are God. None of us know all the answers. So therefore, we, that's why we need to experiment when we need to be prepared. However senior, however experienced we are, we should be ready to fail and ready to learn from that failure. Um, the next one. Okay, another quick exercise for you. So this is uh, an image of a World War II plane. Um, so what happened in World War II, the planes were coming back and uh, they were kind of bullet holes, so the red, the dots, all the dots on here, signify roughly where the bullet holes are on planes that came back. Um, and they wanted to increase the survival rate. So there was only a small percentage of planes coming back. They wanted more planes to survive, so a greater number of planes to come back. And they could afford to put a small amount of additional armor on the plane. They couldn't cover the whole plane additional armor because it would be too heavy. So the question is, where would you prioritize reinforcing the plane with better armor to increase the survival rates? Where the markings are. Not where the markings are. Right. Correct. So, up until, so there's a guy called Abraham Wald that, that discovered this. Up until um, him, they had been kind of going, oh, planes are being shot in these places. That's where we should put the armor. And actually, what Adrian Wald, who's a kind of a statistician, pointed out was, these are the planes that are surviving. They're, they're surviving by being shot there. What we don't see is the planes that are not coming back. And the chances are the planes that are not coming back are being shot in places that the surviving ones are. So this is survivorship bias. So where we concentrate on the people or things that make that People are things that made in the past some selection process and overlooking those that did not. So we look at what we see, we look at the, the, you know, the experiments that survived or the things that worked, and we ignore the things that didn't work, and we ignore the, the experiments that, that didn't survive and didn't make it through, and we only make our decisions based on what we see. So we need to pay attention to the bigger picture, um, so that we're not just kind of going, oh, let's put more armor where the holes are. So that's a, a selection of biases. So um, there's kind of there's, there's a whole talk in there in itself, probably. But we need to be aware of the way our brain works. We need to expect the unexpected, and not things that, not think that things are nice and predictable, and we have all the answers. So then we need to go out and actively seek feedback. Um, and, and it's not just seeking feedback. We need to get good feedback. Um, so I travel a lot. I'm on kind of client work and going to conferences. I spend a lot of time in hotels. I get to use a lot of different showers. Um, showers are one of those things where you get in sometimes and you try trying to get the temperature of a shower that you don't know. And you, it's a bit cold. The water's a little bit cold. So I turn the temperature up and the water's still cold. 
So I turn the temperature up a little bit more and the water's still cold. So I turn the temperature up another time and suddenly the hot water comes through and I'm scalding because the hot, now the water's really, really hot. So you kind of, right, turn the water temperature down, tip the temperature down, water's still really, really hot. And all of a sudden the cold water comes through again. So that's a delayed feedback loop. I'm turning the temperature up, but it's not until a few minutes later that that actually takes effect, and then you kind of get this, this kind of chaotic me jumping in and out of the shower. So we're looking at feedback, but we need to look for the right sort of feedback, and we need to kind of be paying attention for what sort of feedback we're looking for. Um, so next video. So this is another test for you, so pay attention here. So video two, please. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. All right, so some of you may have seen this before, and if you have, keep quiet. Who wants to, how, many, how many ball counts or passes between the white players do people count? 16? Any, any alternatives to 16, higher, lower? Are there 13 here? 15? Okay, who saw the gorilla? Okay, about, about half, so that's, that's usually about right. Um, so let's, let's play the, the next video, so video three. The correct answer is 16, so 16 passes. 16 was correct. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. So was anybody, did anybody know about the gorilla looking for the gorilla and therefore missed the player walking out? Yeah, so this, 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 this um, I know, experiment test exercise got quite well known. So they made this second version. So what happens normally, you'll, the first time you watch it, you're watching the balls and you miss the gorilla because you're so focused on, on counting those balls. Second time round, you're kind of going, oh, I know what's going on here. I'm going to look for the gorilla. And because you look for the gorilla, you now miss the player walking out and the, the, the background changing color. So this is known as inattentional blindness. Um, so an event in which an individual fails to perceive an unexpected stimulus that is in plain sight. Um, another good experiment of this um, they did was they had a, a clown on a, um, on a unicycle cycling around an area. And they had some people walking through that area, and they split them into four groups. Um, one group was, was just walking through. Another group was talking to each other. Uh, I think there was another group that were listening to music on MP3 players, and another group that were talking on their mobile phones. Um, the people talking on their mobile phones generally fail to spot the, the clown on the unicycle, which is kind of a fairly obvious thing to you'd thought you'd be able to spot. So if you're focused on one thing and you're looking for one thing, you're going to miss a whole lot of other useful information. So we need to be aware of in, um, inattention and blindness. So when we're looking for feedback, it's not just looking for the feedback we're expecting. Again, we need to be looking for the feedback that we don't expect. We call that scanning, uh, kind of widening the scanning horizon. Um, so it's also kind of known as the... Um, the, uh, I think it's called the light syndrome. Um, so there's a, a, a joke. So when I say joke, don't, don't get, too, um, get your hopes up. So there's a, a drunk 
looking, kind of scrabbling around under a lamppost. Um, and a policeman came across the drunk and thought, I, I, should, I should talk to this guy and find out what's going on. So the policeman said to the drunk, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing scrubbing around under the, light po the, the, the lamp post? And the drunk said, I've, I've lost my keys. I'm looking for my keys. So the policeman said, ah, OK, I can help you with that. So the policeman looks around under the lamp post. They can't find the keys anywhere. So the policeman says to the drunk, are you sure you lost your keys here? Because we can't find them. And the drunk went, oh, no, no, I didn't lose them here. But this is where the light is. I'm not going to find them anywhere else, am I? So, so we look for things where, the, where it's easy to look for things. We look for things where the light is. So there's kind of the, the metaphor of the, of the, of, of the light. And, uh, and that helps us see the feedback. So an another um, analogy I like is playing golf. So if you play golf, does anybody play golf? Not many? OK, this metaphor may not be that meaningful then. So you, you, everybody knows what golf is. So you're going to play golf, and you're going to practice your swing. You go to the driving range. You place the ball. You hit the ball. You kind of see where it goes. If you do that in the dark, you're not going to see where the ball went. So you're not going to be able to improve your swing. Whereas if we're doing it in the light, we can see the ball's gone left, it's gone right, it's gone further than we thought. So now we can adjust our, our posture and our swing to get better. So we need to turn the lights on. So rather than just having, having a single spotlight looking in a single area, let's try and illuminate a much wider area so that we can get more information and we can get more feedback. So turning the lights on a little bit more. Um, and this is one way of doing that. So just a couple of kind of models techniques. So this is called the Ladder of Inference by Chris Argyris. Um, and he calls it a ladder because he says what we do is we climb to the top of the ladder very, very quickly. So we find it very easy to take action. But actually what we need to do is climb down the ladder. So we take action because we have adopted some beliefs about something. We have adopted those beliefs because we have drawn some conclusions and we've drawn those conclusions from making some assumptions. We've made those assumptions because we've interpreted some data and that data is a bit of data that we've selected from reality and that's the reality that we have observed. Okay, So kind of working way back the other one, there's a, there's a whole universe of reality out there. We observe some of it, and we select which bit of that we're going to observe. And we interpret that to create some meaning. And from that meaning, we start making assumptions about the world. And from those assumptions, we draw conclusions about events and adopt beliefs based on those conclusions from which we take action. So a simple example is um, if I was a manager, and uh, one of my employees, let's call, uh, let's call her Jennifer, came in to the office late every day. I could take the action of firing her, kind of going, you're coming in late, you're lazy, you're not very good at your job, I'm going to fire you. So what's happened is I've adopted my beliefs about her laziness, I've drawn conclusions um, that she's always in late, I've probably made some assumptions about why she's coming in late, I, she's lazy, she can't be bothered coming in on time. Um, I've interpreted from meaning and the reality I've selected is just, you know, she's coming in late on these days that I observe. But actually, the reality might be that um, Jennifer kind of can only get one bus in a day and that bus happens to get in a few minutes later than we would like. So actually, that's the reason she's late. So what I need to do is climb down the ladder of influence and start thinking about wh what do I believe? What are my beliefs? What are the conclusions? What are my assumptions? And what, what's leading me to those? What, what meaning am I generating? And what am I observing? And then I can basically ask Jennifer or whoever the same questions. Is her reality the same as my reality? Probably I'm going to discover that something's different. So, so it's asking questions. So this is called insert assertive inquiry. Because I have my opinions, and I'm, I'm going to assert them, but I'm not going to assume that I'm correct. So I'm going to then make inquiry to the other person about why they, they, why they would take different action or why they have different beliefs. And we can kind of work together down this ladder of influence to kind of start. And ultimately, it usually comes down to that what data are we each looking at and how are we interpreting that data and what meaning are we, what assumptions are we making about that data? Those are where the differences are. And if we can start understanding some of those differences, then we can start learning 
um, about why we, why we would do different things. And, we, and actually, then we can start getting into running some experiments about those and testing those assumptions. So that's, that's one way, I think, that we can use to kind of widen that scanning horizon and start turning the lights on, is by climbing down this ladder of inference to start understanding what, a, what is everybody else's view of the world. Um, the other Cressogerus model, which is nice, is the, the double loop learning. Um, so he makes, Chris O'Jerris makes a difference between single loop and double loop learning. Single loop is um, where we just, exist, trying to improve an existing way of thinking or an existing model. So we have strategies and techniques that we use, and they will lead to results. If we don't get the results we got, we, that we don't, if we don't get the results we would like to get, then we generally, naturally kind of go through this single loop, where we go back to our strategies and techniques and say, oh, we just need to get better at those strategies and techniques. They're the right strategies and techniques, we're just doing them wrong. So let's just try and do them better. What double loop learning is, is actually going back and again, revisiting the assumptions behind those strategies and techniques and saying, maybe our assumptions are wrong. Why do we do what we do? Maybe we should have some different strategies and try some different techniques and those will lead to results. So instead of just kind of saying, right, we know what the answer is, we're going to follow these, you know, implement these solutions and follow these practices. We just need to get better at them. Taking a step back, doing that double loop and saying, why are we doing these practices? Maybe we could try some different practices and different strategies and techniques. So that's just another way of taking a step back, widening that scanning horizon, turning the lights on so we get more information. Um, finally, a, a, a nice technique for this is ritual descent. Um, so, Ritual Descent is a technique from Cognitive Edge, Dave Snowden, um, where if you have an idea and a proposal, and you want to test that proposal, you want to get feedback on it. Now, normally our way of getting feedback is we present something and we just have a kind of have a general conversation about it. Ritual Descent, it, it ritualizes the idea of getting dissenting opinion. So we, we, we do it in a couple of stages. The first stage would be I would present my idea to a group. Now, when I'm presenting that idea, it's a one-way conversation. The people that I'm presenting it to don't get to give me any feedback yet. They don't get to ask any questions. All they get to do is listen to me, which means they have to listen. So there's the old adage around um, when we're listening to people, normally what we're doing is thinking about what we're going to say, and we're not really listening. So by, forcing the, by saying it, only the presenter gets to speak for a few minutes and present their idea, and there's no feedback yet, we have to listen. Because we have to be thinking about what we're going to say later, which means we have to be listening, rather than just jumping in and talking now. Once the pre presentation is done, the speaker turns their back or puts one of these masks on. So the original idea was you put a mask on. So that's, that's part of the ritual then, is you're ritualizing the idea of we're now moving into dissenting mode. Um, and the mask means that it depersonalizes the feedback. Um, because you, you, while you can, you can kind of see the eyes, you can't really see the facial expression so much. Normally what people do now is you just turn your back. So again, you've got no eye contact, you can't see the facial expressions, but you can still hear the feedback. And then with the feedback, it, the feedback is as dissenting as possible. So you're knowingly criticizing the idea as it, in an extreme way as you can, um, which most people find really, really uncomfortable. We're kind of used to kind of giving feedback that's kind of nice, and we kind of go around the edges where we don't like it. But actually, what we want you to do with ritual descent is rip apart the idea in every way you can. And then, and, and again, the person that has the idea can't respond. They just have to listen and, and write the other things down. And then they take it away, and you, you do another iteration. You ba basically, you're taking that feedback, the criticizing, the dissenting feedback to improve your idea. And you, do a, you can do a few rounds of this. So it's a nice way, by forcing people to listen to dissenting opinions, you're, you're getting really good, really rich feedback. So it's another way of widening the scanning horizon, kind of turning the, and turning the lights on. So I kind of recommend that as a facilitation technique to, if you've got an idea and you want to improve the idea and get some feedback on the idea. So we're kind of trying to expect the unexpected, and we're actively seeking a kind of wide range of feedback. What we're really talking about is then is, is getting into running experiments. So everything we do, we should treat as a hypothesis that we want to test, rather than assume that it's the right answer and that we know the right answer, and we just need to implement it. So another kind of little tangent down into uh, into Kinevin and, and Dave Snowden. Um, so he has 
people who's so I'm just touch, hands up who's who's seen Kenevan. Okay, a few. So I'll uh, I'm going to go through it really really quickly. Um, come and talk to me later if you want to if you want to understand this in a little bit more detail. He has these um, the, well there's this kind of five domains in there, but the, the four main ones are obvious, complicated, complex, and chaotic. The obvious and complicated domains on this side are what are known as the ordered domains. So that's where things happen in a way we expect them to happen. So obvious, we can, everybody knows what the answer, we can say there's best practice. So we can just do stuff there. We know what to do, we'll just get on and do it. Complicated is kind of known as the domain of experts. Um, so that's when there is good practice. We can go and ask an expert what to do, and most experts will generally agree with what, what a good, a good approach will be. Um, down in the bottom corner here is, is chaotic. That's generally when actually nobody knows what to do. We just need to act. That's kind of when you're in fire floating mode. Just get out of the building. Um, the, the really interesting domain is the complex domain. And this is the way I tend to think about this, is typically where experts disagree. There's no really no known answer. There's lots of different ideas around what the answer would be, and we, we, don't need to, we don't need to go into crisis mode. Um, but where experts disagree, we need to start running experiments. So this is really where we need to kind of start probing, trying things out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. And typically, if I'm in a situation where people have different opinions about what the right approach is, well, what I start asking around is, OK, what are our hypotheses? What are our assumptions that we're making here? How can we run some experiments to test those assumptions? So we can use a little template like this, and a very simple one. We believe that a particular solution will result in an outcome, and we'll know we've exceeded when we have evidence. So again, not just assuming that the solution is going to work, let's make sure we understand why we're using a solution. What outcome are we trying to achieve with a particular solution? solution? And then what things are we going to look for, which are going to help us understand whether it's worked or not? And we need to be paying attention to what's working, and we need to be ready and ready, for, you know, expecting the unexpected that it might not work. So, also, what evidence might we look for to let us know that it's not succeeded? Um, so, this is a quote from Karl Popper. Um, I'll kind of give you a chance to read it, but the the real bit that that I kind of pull out of this is it's t is the the kind of second half. It's too easy to ob obtain overwhelming evidence in favour of a theory, which, if approached critically, could have been refuted. So this goes back to the, um, the exercise right at the start with the numbers 248. Very easy to prove our hypothesis, to confirm our hypothesis. And what we need to be doing is trying to disconfirm them and disprove them. Um, otherwise, we'll just get supporting evidence. All our biases will kick in um, to, to, to tell us that we're right and how good we are and how clever we are. Um, and actually, we're, we're probably going to be wrong the whole time. So run, running experiments, think about how would I know if my hypothesis is wrong? What things would I look for to suggest? Or maybe even what experiments would I run to disprove my hypothesis? Um, and if we're running experiments deliberately fail, we need to make them safe to fail as opposed to fail safe. So that means we need to start small, really short experiments that we can get quick feedback so that if things don't work, we can dampen them down, stop doing them, and the things that do work, we can start investing more and amplifying them. So, you know, if we've never eaten with cutlery before, we probably don't want to invest in a big box of silver expensive cutlery. We might want to start with some plastic cutlery first, try it out, does this work, can we learn how to use it? Okay, yeah, this works, or you know, maybe I'd rather carry on eating with chopsticks. So, start with something small, cheap experiments we can get quick feedback from, and then build on that, build on the learning we get from that, so that it makes it okay to fail, because we've not put people's lives at risk, we've not put people's jobs at risk, we've not kind of put the organisation at risk, um, which is that kind of the, the big experiment that we see is going to work, the big safe implementation, or the big Spotify um, implementation. If it doesn't work, it's not safe. So safe to fail experiments. Uh, and this is, this is one way I like to do this. I don't know whether you can that well, but it, it's an A3 form, so A3, single piece of paper that we can start working through some of, the, some of the areas that we need to address. So we start off with, what's the context of the experiment? So what problem are we trying to solve? And then what is our hypothesis? What do we believe? How do we believe we can solve the problem? And then what's the rationale 
um, why do we believe that's the right thing to do? So not just diving in and doing something, tying it back to the problem we're trying to solve and making sure we've thought through why we think a particular solution is good. Um, and then what actions are we going to take? Okay, so thinking about how do we prove and disprove the hypothesis, what things are we going to do? What results are we going to look for? And not just what results are we going to look for if we're successful, what results will we look for if we look for failure? Let's make sure we're paying attention to both sides of the equation. And then similarly, if we're successful, how do we follow this up? So if this is a short, small, a small, short, safe to fail experiment, if it's successful, we might want to amplify it and roll it out wider. Um, if it's a failure, we might want to damp it down and roll it back and stop doing something. So using a, an A3 as a form to kind of go through this critically, to think through all these areas to make sure that we're not just focusing on success, we're expecting the unexpected, we're thinking about why we're doing things, um, kind of broadening that scanning horizon, turning the lights on, all those things that I've talked about. So failure is our first attempt in learning. A bit of a, a cheesy way of looking at it, but um, I quite like it still. Um, somebody uh, told me that they should also have sail in there as a second attempt in learning. Um, we're going to learn multiple times, so it's not just about the first attempt, but failure is about learning. Failure shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. Failure is something that we actually want to welcome, we want to embrace it. Um, we want to make friends with failure, not be scared of it. Um, because what we really want to do is, is critical thinking. All of this, these ideas that I've talked about, I think we just really, if we can get good at, at thinking about things critically, rather than just jumping into the first idea we have, or going with the most popular idea and the kind of crunchy trend, current trendy idea, we're more likely to be able to improve, we're more likely to be able to get better. Um, so we're, we're delivering software better, our organizations are, are more likely to be successful. So the critical thinking, the intellectually disciplined process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information to reach an actual conclusion. Not just jumping in with the first idea, not just following with the most popular. Um, so just at the reference step, so to kind of that's, that's most of the content over with. A lot of the ideas behind this book, this talk, come from this book. It's a great book, Black Box Thinking, um, and he, he talks about the need for failure in organisations. Um, and he, he talks about, and he kind of makes two distinctions. The black box, the, the metaphor comes from the, the airline industry, black box. Um, so every airplane has a black box in it. Um, when we get on a, an airplane, we don't want it to fail 50% of the time, do we? Well, I don't anyway. Um, because, because that's not a safe to fail kind of failure, is it? So it's like we want our airplanes to be fail safe. But what the airline industry are really good at is where there is a failure, they're really, really good at learning from it. That's why they have black boxes in place, and the flight recorders and the voice recorders, the cockpit recorders, so that they can go in and they can figure out what actually happened, what, what caused this, what can we change so that this doesn't happen again? And that's actually why the airline industry is so safe. Compare that to the, the medical industry, the healthcare industry. Um, there are lots of stories in the healthcare industry where things have gone wrong um, on the, in the, the emergency room or on the operating table um, and somebody dies. And quite often the response is, oh well, you know, these things happen. Human body is a complex thing, you know, we can't cater for all these things, and it kind of gets brushed under the carpet. And, and the medical, the healthcare industry is not so good at learning. I think they're improving. I think there's examples out there where they're getting better at this. Uh, but the irony here, of course, is that because because the human body is more so complex, we need to be learning from failure in the healthcare industry even more. Whereas you could argue that uh, the, the airline industry, an airplane is just complicated. We can take it apart, put it back together again, build another one. Um, but that because of the, we, we get that safety, we get that improvement through disciplined, critical learning from failure. Um, there, was a, there was a statistic, I think, that compared these two, which kind of showed that you are, you are significantly, you're statistically more likely to die when you go to hospital than you are when you get an airplane, which again is quite counterintuitive. Okay, let's just close with one last little video. So this is a, a, a Disney video. Um, just to kind of try to sum up these ideas around 
to think, think through the, the, the things I've talked about and um, why Disney and Pixar make such good films. Okay, we'll take the last video. <laughs> checks or something and then they kind of decided that actually that was going to work. So they're really good at having kind of really wide scanning horizon and expecting the unexpected to happen, being prepared for it um, and trying lots of different things out and that's to me that's that's one of the kind of the secrets behind why they make good films and I think we can learn a lot from that. Um, so just some links I'll, I shall make all these slides available so you've got all the references. Um, I've been kind of put up um, written up an early version of this talk, so there's some of the links and references are in there as well. Um, the template that I showed you can download from the, the middle URL, um, and then this is all part of kind of a, a bigger kind of body of work that um, I'm interested in, and known as strategy deployment, which is really about how can we get organisations really becoming learning organisations by experimenting, trying things out, and fit, allowing the, the the workers, the people who are closest to the problem, to solve the problems rather than assuming. Um, kind of management and leadership know what the answers are. So, as I said, it, uh, the original title, Failure is Not an Option, that's a slight play on words. What I mean is failure is not optional. Failure is a, necessi is a necessi necessity. 
um, we actually need to fail to learn. So, um, there's a famous quote with the, the light bulbs, uh, you know, I, didn't, uh, I think he said, I, um, I can't remember the exact quote now, I did fail a thousand times, um, you know, you, you just learn a thousand times. But everything we do, everything we're learning is building towards being successful. Um, thank you very much, my time is up.